Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the next panel. Um, the panel is on naming cells using validated antibodies. Um, they'll be moderated by Andrea Rutke, and I will promote her to panelists in a moment, um, ideally right at five, you're two minutes early. Um, many of you saw the opening, the arguments that we need not just uh, agreement on naming for um, anatomical structures, cell types, and biomarkers, and it's not trivial to get that agreement on names. But ultimately, we also need to understand what uh, 2D or 3D areas these anatomical structures, cell types uh, occupy, and um, also there are now antibodies. And you will learn a lot about antibodies, antibody panels from the set of uh, panelists that are now going to come to the stage. So I will let everybody in, and they can introduce themselves and then take it away for the 5 p.m. panel in this 24-hour marathon session. Four of you. And I'll sh should I share it? Yeah, start sharing. <laughs> Everybody um, should have received a welcome uh, to uh, become a panelist. So I should soon see Michael Smith and Jeremy Fisher here as well. Mm -hmm. I welcomed them. They just have to okay that. And then I'm going to disappear and it's all yours. And I know you have um, cool video footage and an amazing panel. Thank you all for coming in on a Saturday afternoon. It's wonderful to have you here. Yes, thank you, Kati. Uh, and thank you all for joining. So if you can, Kari, just put into the chat the handout and we're waiting on Josh Cruteau. And um, yeah, so we'll wait maybe a minute or more. And then panelists, I have you guys where I introduce you um, in, on, a, on a slide next. So um, yeah, so we'll, I guess we'll just wait a little bit, right? Josh is here. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Here. And you can say hi. Werner's got a, a light up tree there <laughs> or something, right? Very nice. Um, perfectly uh, appropriate. This is uh, supposed to be the holiday edition of everything. All right, your panel is complete. Please take it away. Good, good. Well, thank you so much, Kati. And thank you, everyone. And yeah, really excited to kick off as we're going into the evening hour. So good evening, Washington, D.C., Bethesda. That's where Josh and I and the East Coasters are tuning in. Good night, uh, Werner in, in, in Germany and in London. So Werner Wave is here at 11 p.m. his time. Yes. And um, a good morning, uh, Tokyo and others. So we're glad that you could join us. And I'll, I'm excited to have this panelist and I'll introduce them in a few slides. Um, so just a hello and welcome. There's a handout in the chat. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover and I want you to make sure that you know the biographies of the distinguished panelists and so you can have more details there and I'll also introduce them in a, in a slide soon. Um, so background and introductions, yep. Uh, and excited <coughs> we have um, vendor and behind the scene videos. So. Uh, folks at BioLegend, Cell Signaling Technology, Leica Microsystems, and Miltenny were very generous in sharing a video that Devin Wright put together. So you could really see where these antibodies come from and learn about the advanced instrumentation. Also, we'll talk a little bit about organ mapping antibody panels and community efforts to really accelerate multiplexed tissue imaging and spatial biology with a short five minutes video. So I highlight this as I'm converting between slides and, and videos that we get a little elf and magic that all goes well. Uh, and then finally, our panel discussion, which will be 30 minutes with these distinguished guests and hope you'll tune in and ask your questions. We have some prepared questions. Uh, and then thank you in closing. And so right out of the gate, I want to thank Devin Wright, who put a lot of the organization, uh, he's a magical little elf behind the scenes, help with the videos in the handout and all that you see. Kati Borner is a 24-hour event, but I swear she gets 36 hours out of every day and just really cool what, what she's able to do, along with <laughs> panelists and guests and all of you guys tuning in. Okay, so... Uh, we talk about the need for building this human reference atlas, providing a spatial context for all the cells and structures in the human body. The why that we're doing this is with multiplex antibody-based imaging. So I'll use this slide to illustrate that we use antibodies, whether they be 404 labeled, DNA labeled, or metal labeled antibodies, um, and the various methods that allow us to get that high parameter depth that Michael and Werner will talk about. So I'll introduce them very soon here. 
Um, and so you see all these different imaging methods, the cyclic staining, cyclic imaging, the cell dive, the maxima, the wall all in one staining or cyclic imaging uh, and all in one staining and all in one imaging. So use again, this figure to illustrate that we are very lucky and fortunate to have experts from uh, companies that actually make manufacture the antibodies. So we have Josh Cruteau, uh, who's a program manager joining us from BioLegend, who's worked with us extensively within the Affinity Reagent Working Group. Uh, and so he's going to talk to you about antibody, antibody formulations, spatial biology technologies. So a great reference there. We're also delighted to have Jeremy Fisher from Cell Signaling Technology, who will also be talking about um, antibodies. And he's a senior group leader, leader in conjugation chemistry. Uh, and he was really helpful helpful with the uh, some of the work that we've done in, in the handout is the, the link is in the handout about conjugation chemistry and modifying your antibodies. So thank you, Josh and Jeremy for being there, being here. We also want to uh, shout out to um, our application manager, Michael Smith from Leica Microsystems. Leica manufactures a lot of advanced instrumentation, and, and he's going to share with us about the cell dive, which really can empower uh, reference atlas cr construction. Uh, so thank you, Michael. And then last but certainly not least, we've got Werner Muller. Uh, hopefully that's somewhat a good pronunciation, Werner, from Milteni Biotech. Um, and he's going to talk to us about the Maxima program or, or platform, uh, again, a cyclic imaging and staining that employs reagents. Uh, and so it's both instruments and reagents. And thank you all for being here. Um, and so the next part is we're going to move into our vendor behind the scenes. So thank you guys again for contributing videos. And so it's going to be prepare yourselves It's 15 minutes. Devin Wright has merged your videos that you shared. Um, so get a hot mug of cocoa and I'm going to stop and share and get the video queued up here. So fingers crossed. And I think it's really exciting because um, here we go. Here's the movie. I love what you guys put together because I learned more about where antibodies come from, the rigor that you have and validating them and some of the very cool platforms that you guys have developed. So I'm going to play this 13 minute and 50 second video for all of you. Thank you, everyone, joining me today to celebrate by legends a new campus. Yes, we can hear. Our mission is enabling legendary discovery from research to cure.
antibodies play a critical role in the scientific community nowadays. They're a critical component in many areas of research. And as a result, it's highly important that the customers and the scientists who use these antibodies can be confident in the results that they get from them. And there, there's a shared responsibility there between a vendor such as CST and the scientist who, who uses those antibodies. In the immunohistochemistry group at CST, we're responsible for validating the antibodies that we produce for immunohistochemistry and we ensure that the antibodies work appropriately in that application. We're involved all along the development process. We're involved in selecting the rabbits that are put into the monoclonal campaigns. And then we are screening monoclonal campaigns along the way to determine which clones have the ability to work in IHC. And then at the very end of the process, we are validating the final clone for use in immunohistochemistry. There's a variety of tools that we use. And what's clear is that no one assay is sufficient to confirm specificity in IHC. We put together a collection of data to help convince us and to convince customers that the antibody is performing specifically. When we recommend an antibody for a given application, we guarantee that it will perform in that application when using the protocol that we've specified. A protocol is a very important part of the, the recipe for success and alterations in protocols can actually impact the performance of antibodies. So we have performed the validation and we're comfortable with the results using the protocol that we recommend. And then we suggest that customers do the same. And if they struggle and do not achieve desirable results, we will work with them to help them get the appropriate results, assuming that they're using the protocol that we have recommended. Technical service at CST is definitely unique to the industry. We have maintained for as long as we have been in business a unique model that enables our customers to contact the company and be put in touch with a scientist who's working in the lab, producing the product, doing the formulation and testing of that antibody. That scientist is not only highly familiar with the product itself, but often highly familiar with the biological systems that that customer is using as well. That enables them not only to get highly qualified support from a scientist who knows the application really well, whether that be Western blot, immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry, but you also get a scientist who's all quite often very familiar with the biology behind it as well. So they can often help troubleshoot the experiment technically and sometimes provide uh, even guidance in terms of experimental design as well. We can certainly make recommendations on the protocol, recommendations for appropriate controls, and often the case may be that we actually provide an appropriate control that is not sold as a product, but we make here in-house and we may custom make it for a scientist uh, as a customer to help uh, troubleshoot their experiment. I mean, our job within technical support is to get their experiments to work and make them successful. It's no secret that we are considered at the very top of the industry in terms of the quality that we provide. The reasons behind it is all the effort that we put in thoroughly validating the products that we sell. We are also a research institution, so we're committed to rural research. So we actually behave very much in the same way that our customers behave. So we feel their pain because sometimes we also buy reagents to our research that they fail. So we understand that very, very deeply. And from that culture comes the investment into doing good science when we validate tools that other people will buy and use. And that leads in the end to an uh, uncompromising business ethics. So we simply refuse to sell bad stuff. We're not going to do that. And uh, we've always been that way since we started. And that's never going to change. My name is Michael Smith, Applications Manager for Celldive. Thank you so much for having me here today. I just want to take a quick couple of minutes to introduce you to the Celldive Multiplex Imaging Solution. First, what is multiplex imaging and what can it do for researchers? It's probably easier to start with explaining what traditional imaging is for human tissues. In the past, single tissue sections might be stained chromogenically for up to five markers. And if additional markers were of interest, serial sections might be used. But getting good spatial resolution for a lot of markers is a challenge with this technique. Alternatively, genomic approaches such as RNA-seq can deliver expression information on a lot of biomarkers at once, but much of the spatial information is lost. And so CellDive is an end-to-end -end solution that can visualize up to 60 plus biomarkers 
biomarkers using an iterative staining process to deliver high resolution spatial information on many more markers than traditional imaging could achieve. And this is becoming especially critical in the cancer field, for example, where a thorough understanding of many different proteins in the tumor microenvironment is needed for new therapeutic development. Multiplex imaging with cell life can help to predict patient outcomes, improve patient stratification, and aid the understanding of patient molecular and genomic data. So how does cell dive actually work? Put simply, cell dive is an iterative staining process that uses a gentle dye inactivation solution to repeatedly stain and destain a single piece of tissue. And it achieves this using custom study management software, onboard and automated imaging and image corrections, and an open platform that allows the system to work within your lab's needs. Slides are loaded into the imager, tissue regions are selected, and a multi-round process of biomarker staining with conjugated antibodies, followed by an activation and staining with new antibodies begins. The images are automatically registered and stitched and made ready for immediate analysis. So, using this process, many different biological pathways that might only be analyzed separately can be viewed in concert. For example, with this colon adenocarcinoma tissue, we're able to look at a panel of immune markers, metabolic markers, and apoptotic markers all at once and learn lots of new biology about the tissue and the relevant disease state. We describe cell dive as open multiplexing because you can choose the staining workflow that works for you, such as bench top staining, staining with a liquid handler, or staining in an auto stainer. And the thing that makes this all possible is ClickWell. Initially invented to remove repetitive cover slipping from the process, ClickWell is a slide holder that opens the door to automation of various kinds. And what's more, ClickWell increases your options for scaling up your workflow to many slides. And I don't have time to go into great detail today, but one of those options for automation scaling is the bioassembly bot by Advanced Solutions, developed specifically for our instrument. It allows the researcher to automate staining and dye inactivation for up to 15 click wells and reduce the overall workflow to just two user touch points. And just to give you a sense of what this looks like in practice, we have a short video here. The BAB, as it's called, seamlessly integrates with the overall cell dive solution. It intelligently optimizes staining and incubation timings to achieve 100% duty cycle for the imager, and has a number of convenient features to improve staining, such as integrated sample rocking and reagent chilling. So I hope I was able to give you just a taste of what cell life can deliver for multiplex imaging studies, and I'm happy to be here to answer any questions you might have. Okay, last but so not least, the Maxima. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Staggering in all its complexity and beauty. It's no wonder we can barely wait to unravel nature's mysteries. The Maxima imaging system is an easy-to-use, fully automated instrument that rewards users with ultra-high content imaging on a scale that is simply unrivaled by anything else. So intuitive that users can simply plug and play without any special training. Imaging experiments can begin at once. Powerful and dependable, the Maxima instrument helps researchers unlock new insights, making it the workhorse of any laboratory. Our multi-parameter imaging cell screen technology uses the principle of iterative staining with any of our 1,500 plus validated fluorochrome conjugated antibodies to acquire microscopy data. The process comprises three main steps, all of which are conducted in a fully automated manner. First, samples are stained with recombinantly engineered reaffinity and readilease antibodies from our ever-growing portfolio. Next, immunofluorescence images of the desired sample areas are acquired. Finally, the fluorescence signal is erased either by photobleaching or by specific and controlled fluorochrome release using our sophisticated readilease antibodies. Both mechanisms can be used in the same experiment without harming sample integrity. The process then restarts and continues through as many iterations as you have antibodies to stain with. In this way, hundreds of markers can be acquired from just a single sample. Whilst the instrument runs, users can busy themselves around the lab or else analyze images in real time. The powerful Max IQ View image analysis software allows for the selection and direct localization of cells based on the expression of markers. It easily handles such high volumes of data, making it simple to perform segmentation, gate cells and scatter plots, T-SNE plots, heat maps, and much more. It's up to the user to choose what to analyze and how to display it. The Maxima Imaging Platform gives you the flexibility to characterize specific cells and produce a vast, meaningful array of data, all from a single platform. What's more, the sample remains unharmed and can be used for downstream applications. The complete platform, including the instrument, Validated recombinant antibodies for guaranteed reproducibility, click-and-place sample carriers, 
and intuitive execution and analysis software helps you to unlock new insights and push your research further, faster. See more than ever before. The Maxima Imaging Platform. Great. Well, thank you guys. I, I really, personally, I really love all those videos to go behind the scenes, to see the antibodies, see the rigor that you have for validating the antibodies, learning more about your advanced instrumentation. Um, I'm just going to take a pause. Okay. Yep. Great. Oh, there's um, questions in the chat. Okay. So just so long as I didn't miss anything. And if you guys have to the audience members, if you have questions about any of these technologies or, you know, we can wait to the end with the panelists and I'm sure the panelists, you know, can provide their contact information as well. So now I'm going to transition back to the slide deck um, and get us back on track for the, you know, we made the first movie. So now you're seeing, right, we accomplished the vendor behind the scenes, right, guys? You're giving me a thumbs up. Yep. Werner's nodding. Thank you guys again. And we're at the five minute and 20 mark. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what makes it so challenging to, to map these cells with antibodies and how we really need to partner with experts and in industry to do that. And so, and also work as a community. So the next part is talking about taking those collections of antibodies and applying them to a tissue. And again, we're grateful to work with our colleagues featured on the call as part of the Affini Reagent Working Group that's part of HubMap. And so we created um, this this is a figure from the paper that came out in November 2021. I included that link in the handout. So maybe, Kata, you can resend the link for the handout if people are joining late. But the point is that creating that collection of antibodies to do that highly multiplex as demonstrated by the Maxima and the cell dive, that requires, you know, identifying what are the cell types and structures in your tissue of interest, validating those antibodies uh, with appropriate positive and negative controls, and then making sure that those antibodies work together in a panel. And these could be dozens or in some of the really highly multiplex, like hundreds of antibodies. And we'll hear about that in the panel discussion. And importantly, this can take a very long time, weeks to months to validate these antibodies. And they're very costly. Um, and then, of course, the data analysis is an, another aspect. So. Within the Human Biomolecular Atlas program to support human reference atlas uh, construction, we said, let's come up with a way of saying, hey, this is an organ mapping antibody panel. And again, all the people that are on this call, uh, Werner, uh, Kadi, of course, Jeremy, Michael, and Josh have all supported the OMAPs. And so that's a question for the panelists. But just as I showed you the pain points of finding the markers, finding the antibodies, validating the antibodies, and then validating the full panel, the OMAP is a solution to those challenges. And that, what is an OMAP? So we first ask authors uh, that do spatial biology, whatever the platform, if it's Codex, we support Codex, Cell Dive, Maxima, um, metal-based approaches, Ibex. We ask them to say, you know, in your tissue of interest, what are the structures? What are the cell types? Uh, we also say at minimum, you need to have at least 10 plus protein biomarkers because as you, we already learned today and the beautiful talks earlier that there's trillions and trillions of cells. So, you know, we need lots of antibodies, not trillions, but we need lots of antibodies antibodies to define these structures. Then we also want to select appropriate antibodies that work for that organ, for that tissue preservation method. And, you know, community efforts can go a long way to say, hey, these antibodies work and we recommend them. And presently, we're using a lot of vendor websites. So thank you guys for making things so useful to query uh, along with uh, repositories and other resources. Then we want to validate the antibodies. We need to oftentimes make the antibody suitable for our OMAP. And so we'll hear from Jeremy me and, and others about conjugation, you know, making custom conjugations and then validating the panel so that we don't have signal uh, crosstalk or uh, if for the cyclic imaging methods like cell dive and Maxima and, and Ibex that there's no uh, cycle effects. And so we have to evaluate that. And finally, we have to publish this OMAP so we can share that knowledge um, and there's a reward in sharing. And so we've talked about how we document what's needed, the OMAP table, the OMAP description, the antibody validation reports, that's what we mean by AVRs, and all those links um, to our OMAP website, SOP and facts are in the handout. So again, a shout out and also just uh, acknowledging many, many people behind the scenes. And so here we go. If you get anything from this talk, Human Reference Atlas, 
it's a huge effort. It's a community effort. We need to work with academics and industry. Uh, and we're working across the working groups with the ASCT plus B working group led by Kati Borner and the Affinity Reagent Imaging and Validation Working Group uh, led by Neil Kelleher, co-chaired by Liz McDonough and myself, uh, and a lot of work behind the scenes. So again, these OMAPs are these antibodies that define the cell populations and structures in the tissue, and they're going to be tailored to your organ of interest. And again, we get a lot of support from industry leaders. And so this is out there, this is public. So we really wanna ask you guys to contribute an OMAP and we definitely wanna to talk to our panelists about how they can, can support this effort. And so then finally, um, you know, in the last remaining five minutes before we transition to the panelists, just talk about one of the methods. So, you know, that I've been involved in and co-developer is called IBEX, Iterable Bleaching Extends Multiplexity. It's open source and both from the imaging and registration pi pipeline like CellDive, it allows us to use antibodies from many different vendor support. Um, and we use many different microscope configurations and shown it like the Maxima mouse and human. So we're glad that Maxima supports mouse and human tissue issues, fixed frozen FFPE. And so we really believe in sharing our knowledge. And so we are creating a reagent repository that has primary, secondary, nuclear labels, what works, what doesn't work, the different fluorophores that are compatible with the dye and activation chemistry, sharing software publications, uh, frequently asked questions. And so that's a labor of love by my colleague Ziv Yenef, who's not in the call, but he's really in the open software and he's been supporting that. So we're going to launch that, the IBEX imaging community version 0 0.1, Managing Expectations, December 21st, 2022. And if you're interested in this, you know, please email us with the title IBEX Imaging Community. And I've already uh, included 640 antibodies that, that I validated um, for the method. And then um, the next part is I want to take you behind the scenes of some of the workflow that we use for validation bring you into the lab, just as we were brought into the labs and HQ for the various um, commercial uh, partners here, and just tell me, okay, you know, we have the cartoon where you have your tissue on a slide. So how do you do that? How do we do our immunolabeling? Um, what are all the antibodies that we use? Uh, and then how do we image on the microscope? And so this, again, this is a workflow for our antibody validation and our manual IBEX, uh, but also could be extended iteratively. Um, so now I'm going to stop and I'm going to share a video. And it's not the professional quality that we saw from everybody else. Um, but, you know, bear with us and uh, here you go. So it's five minutes and then we'll get into our panelists. So thank you guys. So as you're well aware, if tissue doesn't grow yeah. on slides or on substrates that are amenable to imaging, we have to first section them using a very sharp blade on the cryostat um, to get them to to place them onto a glass substrate that we can use for imaging. And so um, I've had a lot of fun with this instrument over the many, many years. You know, if you don't bleed for your science, does it really count? Um, but the blade hidden under that red safety bar is exquisitely sharp. Uh, so one always needs to be careful. And so the idea is that we take this little light pink tissue that's in that white block, we're able to section that into very thin pieces and adhere it to, in this case, a glass slide. And then we use that to apply our antibodies uh, and then do imaging. Okay, let's talk antibodies, the stars of multiplex tissue imaging. And so here we have arrayed all the different reagents that we use for multiplex tissue imaging. And these antibodies and associated reagents are on the nice list, so to speak. These are antibodies that we have validated for human fixed frozen tissues, the different colored caps denoting the fluorophore that they're labeled with. Uh, we have them organized by project. And again, as I said, species. So these are human and tissue preservation methods. So human and fixed frozen. We have human and FFPE samples. And we have um, mouse tissues, mouse fixed frozen. In many cases, it's important to also have secondary antibodies. So we can detect different isotypes of antibodies, whether it be rabbit or mouse, so that's needed. And then also, if we do not have an antibody that is conjugated to the right fluorophore, so it doesn't have the right colored cap, many times then we need to conjugate in-house uh, using commercially available kits and or partner with our friends and industry to make a special format for us. So that'll work in our panel. And then also we need to use appropriate blocking reagents so that our antibody labeling uh, is reproducible and specific 
and targets the appropriate protein um, without nonspecific background staining. And then after all that effort, we come to da -da, the OMAP, which is a collection of antibodies that work re reproducibly in that tissue. And that is, I often feel like Gollum in the ring, that collection of antibodies, that OMAP um, is really your precious. It reflects thousands and thousands of dollars and years in the making. So again, these are the stars of multiplex tissue imaging, and it takes years and years and years to build this arsenal. And again, these are just the nice, on the nice list, we have a whole collection of antibodies that yield inconclusive staining on our so-called naughty list. Okay, we're ready to cook. I often refer to antibodies as ingredients and organ mapping antibody panels as recipes because they provide both the ingredients and the instructions for their use. And so what are we cooking today? Well, we have our tissue section, which I showed you earlier. We have a nice little bubble of antibody cocktail on top. So we directly applied the antibodies to the tissue and we're using our blocking buffer to eliminate nonspecific immunolabeling and off-target labeling. And then we have a series of a nuclear marker on the left along with directly conjugated antibodies and various fluorophores ranging from Alexa 4488 all the way to Alexa 4700. And so we're gonna apply this directly to the tissue and then image the results. Okay, I told you it was time to cook and I wasn't kidding. We use a non-heating scientific microwave to reduce the immunolabeling time and yield high quality staining. Um, and so this microwave isn't required for doing your immunolabeling, but it certainly has accelerated our workflows. And it is one of the hardest working members of the team. And we love this device. And now we're in the microscope room, one of my favorite places in the entire world. <laughs> a lot of good times. I love that in microscopy, the light reveals what's hidden in the darkness and that it makes the unseen seen. And we bring with it just a sense of discovery, anticipation, awe, and deep reverence. And here we are looking at a human jejunum, which we've labeled with fluorescently conjugated antibodies and are visualizing using a confocal microscope. Okay. Great. Okay, so it's definitely, yeah, let's, uh, now we come back to our slide and our question. Thank you guys. Um, da -da -da. Okay, yep, uh, ground control. Now the real stars of the show, you guys have been so patient. So now we, we accomplished, now we get to our panel discussion, hooray. And maybe send again the handout in the chat, uh, Cut if you don't mind, so that people can really read about the distinguished guests that are here. And so um, now we got 30 minutes, guys. We're right on schedule, honestly. And so this is a question open to everyone, just reminding again, that we have Josh Cruteau, who's a program manager from BioLegend, Jeremy Fisher, who's a senior group leader uh, specializing in conjugation chemistry, Michael Smith, who's an application manager specializing in the cell dive. Uh, and uh, then lastly, again, sorry, Werner, it's alphabetical by company, but then I changed No problem. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you, you, he's like at 11 o'clock in Germany, he has to deal with an elf and he's last, so, but certainly not least. And then I switched the order. So thank you, thank you. So here's everyone. And so so you can yeah unmute yourself and you guys are there. So who wants to, you know, our first question is what value does a human reference have for industry and how can it help improve health and precision medicine? So please don't be shy. Uh, go ahead and answer if you, if you feel so compelled. Okay. Apparently we're all very shy today. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll call on people, right? The elf will get naughty and call on people. Okay. <laughs> so Jeremy, yeah, it seems like you're ready. And yeah. then, so Jeremy, then Michael, how about that? I, I mean, I think the Human Reference Atlas is uh, an incredible tool. It's intuitive and interactive, uh, virtual, and for people like us in industry to use as a reference tool for researchers like yourself, pathologists and doctors um, to help classify various areas of pathology and disease or really push the, the, uh, the envelope and allow new discoveries to be made, basically. 
Great. Thank you. No, we're glad for the support. And then um, we totally agree. We we drink our own Kool-Aid. Yes. Yeah. And then Michael, uh, no, it's not Kool-Aid. It's good stuff. Michael, I mean, it seemed like you want to talk and, and you and you teed it up with Cell Dive with the precision medicine with the tumor microenvironment. And I'm sure maybe you want to talk about that along with perhaps Werner in the Werner in the in the tumor, how healthy can inform uh, malignant. You know, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, it's it's often a struggle for customers who are trying to do these types of studies to get a good baseline or ground truth when they're building out their antibody panels or trying to pick biomarkers to look at. So having like a good um, reference, uh, as the previous panelist said, is, is very important for antibody validation as well as just, you know, performing the experiments and having a way to be able to make um, good, solid comparisons uh, when you're performing these types of studies. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> so maybe also just from, I mean, Miltony is a, com is a company uh, uh, tr uh, developing methods to fight cancer. And we look at many different cancer tissues. And the main purpose of building or setting up the instrument uh, was to have an automated way to look at many different cancer tissues in a, uh, yes, uh, let's say, reproducible way. And 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 so that's, uh, that, and the human reference does provides us with the background of the normal tissue before the cancer is established. So we have always cancer tissue and normal tissue in, in the runs. That's excellent. No, I mean, I really appreciate that what you guys are doing on that space and, and like the CAR T. So knowing yeah. the normal and the diseased and, and to, to what Michael said, exactly knowing that your antibody works um, and the, this human reference atlas can help identify appropriate positive controls that you could then look at yeah. um, the tumor. And we, we do that all the time. For example, with the chromogranin A, going to a pancreas, validating that antibody, and then knowing that that could be appropriate in a particular uh, cancer or carcinoma. So that's, yeah. Any, Josh, do you want to add on uh, with the, the reference atlas and, and how you guys are using or thinking about interfacing with it or yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm keeping myself partially muted. I have my own elf running around, so I don't want to. <laughs> um, yeah. it, your re reference atlases, uh, you know, especially in the context of spatial biology, which is really, it's integrating all of the different ways we do science. I mean, it's hugely important to, I mean, Austin industry, but human health, because without without the free knowledge sharing between experts in different tissues and diseases and things like this, it's not realistic for a, a biotech company, a pharmaceutical company to be able to develop the right tools that are effective for letting us study what we need to study uh, and advance things. So, I mean, it, it's, it's really kind of central to what allows science as a unit to move forward. Great. No, thank you. And we are really grateful that all of you guys tune in and participate in our working group. Um, and again, thank you for sharing your Saturday with us. So that's a testament to the dedication. So we're grateful. Our next question, yeah, it gets into, well, how are you supporting Human Reference Atlas? Well, see that we're here on a Saturday. <laughs> but, you know, and maybe you want to expand a little bit um, and we can, you know, whether you're developing, if you want to talk about partnerships that you have or the conjugations that you support, um, you know, so open it up to uh, to anyone. So maybe I can call and then work. So we just heard from Joshua, maybe Werner, if you want to talk about how you're supporting human reference atlas construction, if there's an OMAP or anything you'd want to talk about. Yeah. Yep. So yes, so just for the human reference atlas, so we are part of a human uh, European research uh, network called Hugo Deca, where mm -hmm. we uh, looked at human gonads and there we generate maps for the human gonads. It's a very specific uh, yeah, tissue, which not many people look at. Yeah. So that's what we are doing at Milton. Great. Yeah, and I know I'll put you on the spot. I know you're also interested in designing OMAPs and you've contributed yes. to our working group. And so, yeah, developing those organ mapping antibody panels that work for the Maxima platform is really, and can help yes. other customers is really, is, is, yes. is really key. So, and yes, I think in more in general, which is not true for that part of organ, we are also very interested to map immune cells. Yeah. And of course, immune cells are very challenging and a more marker we add, the more cell types we discover. So we don't know where the end is and we are running out of names yes. <laughs> because we, we discover new combinations which you didn't see before. Yeah. 
And that's where we're really excited, you know, hold that, put the pin in, you're going to get more work assigned to you. Werner is like, yes. yeah, knowledge about immunology. We want immune uh, OMAPs, tissue residents, yes. immune panels. That's so critical. And yeah, building out the catalog of antibodies that can allow us to define these cell types uh, yes. in cell states. So, yeah. So then how about um, Jeremy, I, you know, as the, I've, yeah, if you want to, you've worked with us about how cell signaling technology is supporting human reference atlas construction. Um, yeah, just take it away. Yeah, we support the human reference atlas construction with uh, by partnering with key opinion leaders and academic labs. We do a lot of sponsored research where we uh, work with them and give them antibodies or at a discounted rate or conjugates. We offer custom conjugations uh, to a variety of fluorophores, many different OXs or protein-based lab dyes like PE or APC um, that enable the, the spatial biology research to be done to enable the, uh, look at the, generate the OMAPs and the, contribute to the human reference atlas. Another thing that CSC really specialized in is, is post-translational modifications, yeah. so different proteoforms. We have a, a site on our, part of our website is called Phosphosite, which mm -hmm. is now another layer, which could actually be really complementary in adding to the OMAPs in the Human Reference Atlas uh, that goes through all the different phosphorylations, ubiquitinations, different um, groups that get attached to the proteins that function as activators or inhibitors uh, to give the proteins new function, basically or dysfunction in some cases. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's so critical. So just as Werner was saying, we need different cell types and cell states with the immune. We definitely want to look at the functional states. And you guys have an impressive catalog to look at those downstream stimuli, to look at the post-translational modifications, um, to look at metabolism. And, and that's really important, again, for precision medicine that we, we can only see if we have a great antibody for. So that's awesome that you guys support that. Um, and yeah. And, and we're grateful. Yeah. And next, Michael, we're working down and then I'll Josh. So Michael, you know, if you want to talk about, and you've actually partnered with some of these, uh, you know, the, the industry leaders as well uh, for the, for the cell dive. Uh, so anyway, take it however you'd like to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're attacking this kind of on a technical level. Um, one of the things I think we're most proud about when it comes to cell dive is the ability to scale up these types of multiplex studies. Um, so, you know, we have a partnership with the advanced solutions, like I mentioned in my, my little intro there, um, which allows robotics to come into this and you can actually use, you know, um, image up to 15 slides. So that can really improve the throughput of this process, which up until now has sometimes been kind of slow. Um, so the more tissues, the more slides, the more um, patients that people can take samples from, the faster it will be to build these reference atlases. Um, and of course, we're also collaborating with the cell signaling technology to have a panel of antibodies uh, that's going to make doing cell dive that much easier to bring up that scale, to get into the hands of more people and to be able to um, build up these, these atlases. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're right. It's uh, all these are slow and tedious. <laughs> I saw like, I think the bio legend video was sped up, right? I was like, well, wow, they have elf magic up there because <laughs> I'll tell you the, the scanning confocal was in real time. So yeah, it's definitely slow, slow. And last Josh. Yeah. How are you, you know, what secret do you have like <laughs> with bio legend? No, just kidding. How are you supporting human reference Atlas construction? And then I'll ask you a specific question about the biology, but uh, the different applications, but just in general, you know, the different formulations and, and of course, uh, high fidelity reagents. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could probably break down my legends efforts into yeah. two categories, uh, direct engagement. So uh, like the work we've done with Andre's group on the IBEX and other KOLs who may lead a specific technique, um, engaging them and basically just hearing what they need creating reagents sometimes that are off the shelf, making them available. So there's not always the right characteristics available for a catalog reagent that can just be purchased. So that requires usually some additional resources. Um, mm -hmm. And along those same lines, you know, we have efforts to continue to expand antibodies that are correctly validated and adequately validated for different spatial techniques. And uh, I think, like I saw in the cell signaling video, um, one way of validating an antibody certainly isn't sufficient for, you know, immunohistochemistry or spatial biology. And as these platforms and different techniques expand, actually, we're learning you need a lot of different types. <laughs> um, 
And so we're continuing to expand efforts there and hopefully get towards building panels um, of our own. Uh, we also make a lot of effort to engage uh, industry partners. So uh, Biologent, we don't, we're not an instrumentation or hardware manufacturer. So, you know, we rely on our reagents to be able to be adopted into other platforms. Some of them may be open like IVEX, but some are gonna be closed and commercial in nature. Um, so we, I will plug them here, but there, there's a number of, uh, advanced spatial technology platforms that are different companies that we seek to try and partner and develop reagents with uh, as well. Great. No, that was a great answer. And yeah, it's, I think it's before we go to the next questions, I just want to you know, talk about exactly that. And that's why the OMAPs are valuable. And that's why, you know, these reagent repositories are valuable because we found, you know, and I mean, it's over a decade of doing this. It's that, uh, you know, it's so dependent, of course, and you guys all know this about you know, the antigen retrieval, if you're doing FFPE, there's a qualitative difference if it's pH six versus pH nine versus pH six to nine. I've told, just a shout out to Zelda, I've come full circle. Like I'm just doing pH six to nine. That really changes the game, right? So I think that's really great. And I know that Maxima, they like a pH nine, many of their antibodies. Yes. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the dual, dual protocol. <clears throat> Uh, and also, if you're using a detergent, that really matters. And then, of course, you know, some antibodies are suitable for a particular tissue, but not others. So we want to capture that information. Um, and so I'm glad that you guys are supporting that, uh, as are we, and that's in the OMAPs. Um, so now a question, because I kept putting Werner last, uh, and he's here almost at midnight. Um, so yeah. can you please tell us about the antibody selection and testing process and, you know, the use of external antibodies on the Maxima. You know, what are their qualifications that if I wanted to bring in an antibody from CST or BioLegend onto your beautiful Maxima system, how, how could I do that? Yeah. So maybe first uh, for the first uh, part, so how about antibody selection and testing? So we were very uh, maybe a straightforward approach, but it, it was very painful. So we decided on the conditions. We made it very strict. Uh, so we only allow for 10 minutes staining because we want to run too many antibodies. And then we took all the antibodies we had and tested every every antibody in these conditions. And only the antibodies which uh, stained under these conditions were then taken forward. So the, this, I think it, it's not a way one would usually do it, uh, so, but, but that was the way to, 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 to get it, uh, to get the antibody list uh, started. Uh, and testing is uh, a lot of work in, on your slide. You already showed the various steps, uh, but I think when you go to multiplexing, it's even, then it's getting uh, very, very complicated. And then you see side, uh, yeah, combinations of, of antibodies which suddenly don't work while they work uh, individually. Um, so the antibodies we are using are recombinant antibodies, and we use a specific uh, human FC modified uh, tail so that they don't bind uh, non-specifically to, to cells. So that is, uh, uh, one can use antibodies without any blocking uh, on, on tissues. Yeah. So that that is uh, uh, the way our antibodies are, are designed. But uh, one can, of course, use other antibodies and uh, um, but one has to make sure that the blocking you, you showed in your in your video that you need uh, to put in blocking reagents to avoid non-specific binding. Uh, but we always use uh, most most of the time we use directly coupled antibodies, so we don't do indirect staining. We can do it for one or two rounds, but it's it's, it's uh, somehow disrupting the the uh, efficiency of the system when we start to do use indirect stains. The external antibodies one can use, uh, the, uh, in the system as it stands, one needs four to bleachable fluorochromes because we just uh, bleach this, uh, after taking the images, we bleach the, the images. And one has to take care with exposure times that the antibodies are suitable for uh, for the exposure times. And of course, one can wait, look longer, like so one can expose the region longer with the, with the tissue. And so forth, but it takes all time. So if you have, a, uh, if you just get maybe three times longer, then the whole process takes on then easily a day more uh, than uh, than if you just have this very uh, yeah short exposure um, uh, staining and exposure times. But external antibodies are fine, um, and one can use them uh, on the system. So because our portfolio is not complete. And and uh, it will take <laughs> ages until we 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 have re, uh, maybe it will never end to get everybody every specificity there. Um, so there's always room for ex, uh, external antibodies on the system. Yeah. 
Great. And yeah. maybe maybe one more one more thing. I, we would recommend to use our antibodies first, and then the external antibodies. Okay. I think that's very important because if there's something wrong, uh, we, because we have, we cannot test external antibodies, uh, so it's, we could recommend to use uh, the inter, uh, the uh, multi antibodies first, and then use the external antibodies in the run. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Great. No, thank you. No, I mean, I'm like 10 minutes, I guess a new, new record, you know, no microwave needed. That's great. So those are very high affinity. And then that's really clever that they're engineered without the FC, you know, uh, that's very, very. No, the FC is, yeah, the FC has, it's mutated. So oh, that it doesn't that bind. Yeah, because that, yeah. that, you can easily label follicular dendritic cells and myeloid cells very easily for that. Yeah. So great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Werner. Uh, and then uh, Michael, you know, so we're going reverse antibody order, uh, alphabetical order. Um, so, you know, how does the cell type platform address batch to batch variation and autofluorescence? I mean, autofluorescence, you know, many could talk about that, but that's a, a real challenge with creating these human reference atlases. And as you mentioned, and we all discussed that we need to do scaling. Um, so if you could talk a little bit, especially with the, the robot, how you might achieve that. Yeah, so I'll talk about the autofluorescence first. So we're taking an image of the tissue prior to staining uh, of just autofluorescence uh, signal prior to every imaging round, which ultimately gets subtracted out. Um, so that's one thing that kind of just directly reduces the autofluorescence. We have a lot of onboard imaging corrections as well that help with image quality. Um, and we provide some guidance in how to set up the, the staining rounds to, to minimize autofluorescence or at least reduce its impact on um, certain channels because there are some channels where some degree of autofluorescence is unavoidable. So you really want to have the brightest possible uh, biomarkers in those channels. With batch to batch variation, um, you know, that's really comes down, I think, to automation because if a person is pipetting, which is a perfectly valid way to, to kind of go through a, a cell dive experiment, um, you know, some batch to batch variation is probably inevitable. So with the uh, bioassembly bot, the BAB um, from ASLS, that's going to take that um, human element out of the equation and make it that it's something that's repeatable um, over time. So those are kind of two different ways that the batch-to-batch -batch variation is minimized. And of course, the cell dive is an instrument, it's a microscope that does one thing. So everything's really locked in. Um, the images are all calibrated in a way that's repeatable. Um, so you'll kind of reduce that variation that might occur in a, a microscope setup that is used for other things. Um, yep. Great. No, thank you. No, those end-to-end -end solutions like cell dive and maxima definitely saves the user but what fun is that no, i'm just kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding no it's great it's great uh you know I'm, i think you'll find there's still plenty to do no absolutely yeah no exactly no and the work just scales right okay so then yeah jeremy so um can you briefly describe your antibody validation process um and then also we to, or if you you know talk about as a conjugation senior group leader for conjugation, uh, the, the conjugation group at CST, you know, talk about how you support customers and those custom formulations. Um, and, you know, yeah, so just kind of, yeah, talk about the validation process and then also custom formulations. Yeah, so the validation process really starts with us um, conjugating, first of all, but even beforehand, we select only the most highly validated, well-characterized clone to, to conjugate to. And then we'll compare the conjugate to the non-conjugate to make sure that the, the antibody performance is maintained and demonstrate that comparing to the unlabeled antibody. This is specific for multiplex to imaging, of course. And then we'll compare a single plex to a multiplex described in the paper. Um, mm -hmm. Make sure there's no spectral bleed over or crosstalk between the, the channels, fluorescent channels. Um, or loss of signal because of, say, epitope masking and things of that nature. So that's how we get to the, the panel building, basically. And then we can also have the opportunity to look at co-localization of signals. You know, two T-cell markers should be co-localized when you go to a multiplex. So we'll, we'll look at that as well. And then lastly, we'll look at the tissue microarray, like, you know, hot and cold tumors, in addition to a variety of other organs as we can cite in the human reference atlas or the OMAPs that we can have more uh, confidence in our antibody's performance or the conjugate's performance. So that's mostly about the antibody validation. And then what CSC offers for custom formulations is 95% of our recombinant monoclonal uh, catalog is available. Um, 
it's available to purchase. Basically, we have it in stock and a significant amount of that is also available off the shelf, ready to ship the next day for customers to label themselves. Say it's in 100, 100 microgram um, vials, easy to set up for, for labeling purposes. Or if you want to focus on your research and you want to focus on the biology and, and designing the panels, then you can come to us for custom conjugation services. And with that, we have a tiered and flexible approach uh, where we can get a basic conjugation, which would be kind of similar to a kit or a degree of labeling. We have varying molar excess and multiple types of dyes per antibody or ratios of dyes per antibody. And then the turnaround time is very fast because we know everybody wants their with their material to get onto their experiments. So we pride ourselves in the turnaround time. And like the videos suggested, if you come to us for a custom conjugation, you, you're basically buying the CST tech support as well. We'll work with you if you have an issue. And if such as the antibody performance, for example, then we'll try a different chemistry. We'll try a different formulation that's not concentrated enough for you. So that's what you get for the uh, custom formulations for, for conjugates and all forms of fluorescent dyes, basically. All, also oligonucleotides, we're now doing DNA conjugations for, for custom purposes. Awesome. No, that's really helpful. We'll have to give you on the schedule of the Affinity Reagent Working Group, you or Katie, to, to talk about all those because that's a huge support. And we're coming in five minutes. So we have our last question for Josh. And then maybe Kati has one question for the group and we'll get us all into the six o'clock hour. So, um, yeah, Josh, you know, I know that BioLegend supports a broad range of spatial biology applications. Uh, can you talk about how you're supporting these spatial technologies, you know, the various applications um, and how you formulate your antibodies uh, for those those methods? Uh, yeah, so Biologen uh, manufactures nearly all the antibodies we make. Uh, we also do nearly all the conjugations on the things that we make. Um, we support at this point uh, a number of conjugates, types of conjugates that I have trouble keeping track of. So it's it's 30 some floors and there's actually we're, we're, we're quite involved with DNA oligonucleotide conjugates. Uh, we have a lot of uh, oligo conjugated antibodies that are commercialized for SiteSeq, which is a single cell technology. But a lot of what I think are some of the maybe the more speculative or um, the newer technologies in spatial that are coming to market involve these DNA oligos in various uh, paradigms. So it may be using those DNA oligos as a landing pad for fluorescent probes to then be visualized on a on a microscope, you know, just like a fluorescent antibody may be. Um, and there's there's lots of versions of how that can look. So, um, you know, there's there's old school just fish, you know, all the way through merfish, which is you know highly combinatorial and, and potentially highly multiplexed. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work with different platform uh, manufacturers and vendors that are making those technologies, maybe own those platforms. And it, when it comes to the reagents, and this goes for the fluorescent conjugates as well, uh, the specifics to that technology really dictate the process starting at the purified. So there needs to be really rigorous validation and QC at the purified level to make sure that whatever you're conjugating is going on something good quality. But um, the characteristics for, you know, a one DNA oligo uh, conjugate compared to another going on to different platform actually may not be the same. Um, and so there's different things like uh, oligo to protein ratio. So just like FTP can be modulated, uh, you know, oligo ratio, oligo purity, residual oligo, these sorts of things all we're learning play big factors depending on how that technology is done. And it's not necessarily that one approach is better than another. It's just different technologies demand different things. And I think it's a really cool time because of all the options that exist, but we really rely on, I think these partnerships with these, these, these other vendors, the companies, and then uh, on our own teams, um, trying to adapt those technologies and get to something that can be scaled and uh, is reproducible over time. Great. Wow. Yeah. No, thank you guys. Thank you all. And so, uh, you know, we're coming, that was a great answer and we're coming at two minutes or one minute left. Uh, so I just want to thank you. Thank you all panelists. Thank you, Werner, for tuning in. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Josh. Um, really appreciate your time on a Saturday and the opportunity to showcase the extraordinary work you're doing. 
And Kadi, you've got the floor. You can turn us over. Yeah. Oh, oh, I can't hear. Yeah. Thank you all so much. This was really insightful. Thanks for sharing the videos. We finally got to see the real OMAPs, not just the digital representation of them, but them in bales. Uh, and then ultimately, there are a number of questions in the chat. Feel free to answer them if you have time. Otherwise, I know it's very late in Germany right now and uh, in other places. So um, thank you, Andrea, for hosting this marvelous panel, for moderating it. And um, Please uh, feel free to uh, enjoy the rest of the 24 hour event. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, and maybe for the questions in the chat, I don't know, well, maybe we can get them and then share them with Werner and then they could answer. I don't know, because I know you have to take it to six, right? <laughs> okay, bye, thank, thank you guys. You. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to everybody. Thank you everybody.